Stanley Harris, born in Harare, Salisbury, uh, the son of Lionel and Frieda Harris, born in 1935, went to school at Prince Edward, and uh, those were the wonderful early days which are easy to talk about. My father's influence in those days was very strong. I mean, he was very sport-orientated, so I was directed through a lot of sports. And uh, I uh, finished school, and I went to Boston. I went to Cape Town University, and uh, I came back from Cape Town University and joined my father's business. Stan, could which, you uh, Stan, could you just mention a, a, a couple of words about where your parents originated from? Yes, well, I'm one of those very fortunate boys whose parents were not affected by the war or the Holocaust. My father, mother was born in Bulawayo. Her father came to Bulawayo with the first train. My father came from Port Elizabeth, born in Port Elizabeth. What was your mother's maiden so, name? My mother's maiden name was Bennett. There was the Bennett family, and uh, that carried on into my father's business when it became Bennett and Harris. Um, the family was this, uh, always. Um, lived and worked in, in Salisbury. And uh, I, uh, I'm trying to sort of highlight the, the, the most important parts of growing up, sure. because it was a very simple growing up period, a very fortunate one, not affected by much. My Habonim days were, were very uh, remunerative, not remunerative, that's the wrong word, <laughs> were very enlightening. <laughs> we went to a bottom camp like everybody else, uh, and friends that we made in a bottom today are still my friends. Tell um, us a bit about those early days of Habonim. What was the focus in those days, uh, Stan? Well, you know, my father was a. Uh, I think my father started a bottom in Salisbury. Uh, Sadie Chaplin was the. Uh, was the original Bakoach, and uh, my father Lano was a second Bakoach in, uh, in, in, in uh, Salisbury. Right. And so obviously I followed along those footsteps. He was always involved with the community. And an interesting thing is I remember my father started the first boxing camp <laughs> because one of the guys, do you remember the name? Gittleson. No, I'm sure you don't. Somebody called him a Jew boy. And my father said, that's it. And they started a boxing club. And uh, we we went, we went learned how to box. I don't know how much good it did, but uh, that's what we did. Uh. Now, uh, um, he, he was always very involved in community affairs, as you, as you well know. And my mother was too. A loyal woman killed, I think my father never, there wasn't a time he wasn't involved in the school committee. So obviously I had that in me when I started getting involved, but I never got involved really in Jewish affairs. I, uh, I came back from, as I say, I went in, eventually went into my own business, which was a furniture manufacturing business, and uh, and I progressed from there. My involvement in the community only started uh, much later. You know, I was always very involved with Rotary, and one day my wife said to me, you give so much time to the non-Jews, what about doing some work for the Jewish community? Huh. And Muriel Rosen got hold of me, and I ended up, you know, being her successor on the Board of Deputies. So, um, huh. I... Uh, I did a lot of work for the Board of Deputies and also the African Jewish African Jewish Congress. Uh. 
I think that when uh, I came in contact with you, um, I uh, those were very good years, and I think we did quite a lot of uh, uh, good for the community. Stan, so tell, us, with me. tell us a bit about your school days. What school were you at? I went to Prince Edward, and uh, I had. Um, my school days were were really good days. I, I remember with much love. To, even to this day, the old boys still meet every every now and then. And uh, you were very involved as in rugby. Uh, you were a good rugby player. By me, I was a good rugby player, but by rugby player, I'm not sure. <laughs> I was I was quite fast. I was an athlete, and I could run really fast. Not as fast as Alan Gershon, but nearly as fast. <laughs> Do you remember Alan Gershon? He died. Sure. So I was very involved with uh, with athletics and rugby, and uh, of course the Wingate Club became a very focal point of attention. Played cricket at Wingate, and then later on played golf. So everything revolved around that sort of. Uh, uh, atmosphere. Right. Do you remember the and, setting up uh, of Wingate, the background to the setting up of Wingate? I remember it very clearly because my father was up in those days because uh, I, I, well, by, I, um, it start, you know, obviously you know how it started when when Dr. Gelfin's wife was blackboard, blackboard joining the uh, Royal Salisbury and Barney Johnson and uh, I've forgotten who was with Barney, but I know my father was involved with I him. think Stan, Stan Jones was involved. Yeah. Yes, Stan Jones, Barney, but Barney Jolson was the prime mover, and Louis Jolson. Uh, and they started the Wingate Golf Club. And uh, that club went from strength to strength. Um, so those days of. You know, I seem to be concentrating on the sporting days because that's where all my friends came from. Um, and to this day, after having, well, I think I must jump because we then decided in 1976 or something, I and my friends, and I'm talking about four friends, there were Gerald Ress, Ronnie Langer, Mike Carp, all said the writing was on the wall and all left to go to South Africa, and uh, and I I went via South Africa on Aliyah to uh, Israel, and uh, I took my family there, and uh, that wasn't a very good Aliyah. I'll tell you something. I'll never forget going to a lecture at high, at, at the Technion in Haifa. And the lady there said, you know, there are two people that make Aliyah, those that want to and those that have to. And I'm not sure which category I fitted in those days. We felt that there was no future, but I never gave up uh, Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. But the positive part about it was that my children came to Israel and they stayed. You know, they all became Israelis and to this day, my Two daughters live in Israel. My son came back here, but he was very, very touched. He was involved with the tennis center there, and now he's doing tennis here. But we came back from, uh, after doing, I went to Israel twice. So we came back to Zimbabwe, Harare, and uh, you know, my mind is going to be a little bit fuzzy, but I want to tell you, that those were the best days when we came back from Israel to Zimbabwe. We set up new homes in Narari because my parents were there. You know, you can't just leave your parents. And when I was in Israel, I was always looking over my shoulder what was. Came back and those were the most successful years. Had a very successful furniture factory. Your father was one of my good customers. And uh, and so those were good days. Those were very, very 
they were lucrative years. And then finally, we decided, you know, my children never left Israel. They were virtually always in Israel. We decided, look, what are we doing here? We might as well go to Israel. So we went back to Israel and uh, we had a flat there and we had wonderful friends, but it was a tough life. And I hate to say it, one day I said to Laurie, you know, are we going to stay or are we going to go back to uh, the land of milk and honey? And we came back, sold up and came back and came to Cape Town. And this is where we are now. And uh, uh, you know, looking back on it, looking back on it, those experiences were experiences of a lifetime. Sure. Stan, I, um, uh, Stan can I just take a step back? Uh, where did you meet Lorian? I met her in, in, in Salisbury, in Rory. She came from East London. And they sent her to Rhodesia to find a husband. And I got in the way. <laughs> so, that's how that happened. And really, I, we've been married 53 years now. And, uh, you know, those, um, Laureen's family were always Islamic and they moved, came and stayed with us, but they passed on, as my parents had passed on. My dad was 93 when he died. Yeah. What was her maiden and, name? What uh, was Lorian's maiden name? Holzler. It's quite a prominent Jewish name from Old Shul. And uh, Well, I could spend another two and a half hours talking about Lori, but I think I won't. <laughs> so now we, I'm in a wonderful situation. Lori works and I play golf. What else can I do? <laughs> you know, um, Go ahead. Yeah. I, I say that one gets involved in one's community and it's very satisfying but once you move out of your community you you don't have that same sort of uh, incentive to do much so here in Cape Town we we exist with friends and look the same friends I had when I was at school which is quite amazing um, I could tell you about my children more than I could tell you about myself. Well, okay. Start again from where you were talking about Anthony and his, he started out at Ramata Sharon. When we went to Israel the first time, because we went twice, the first time the kids went to school and Anthony went to the Ramata Sharon Tennis Centre and got very involved with it. They once sent him over to Israel as a young ambassador, 14 years old, to raise funds for it. When we came back to, to Cape, when he came back to Cape Town, his own tennis academy here. It's based on what he did when he was at Ramada Sharon. Um, I've talked about my daughter, Melanie, she stayed in Israel, as did my daughter Sandra. And Melanie's married with two uh, sons who finishing the army. One's finished the army, the other's um, finishing now. And they are, she's married to an Israeli. And my other daughter Sandra has also got an Israeli uh, uh, husband. Well, and uh, and so we, Anthony came back to, to Cape Town as we've come back to Cape Town. And uh, our connection now with Israel is only when we go to Yontif to spend with him now. I haven't, uh, my early days in Rhodesia and Wagwi are made for the foundation of my life. 
we can never replace those days. But I must say that what we learnt in Israel, in all manners of form, because we went into business, and um, it was very tough, very, very tough. And we realised that uh, we'd be better off in Cape Town than we are. So you're happy there? Oh yes, we are. We're very happy. We're happy that, we, and we're lucky, happy that we can go and visit Israel at Yom Tov, right. and and see the family. And Stan, when you look back at um, the at the community that existed in Rhodesia in Zimbabwe, uh, and what it's left, what is left there now, how do you feel about that? That there's, you know, that it's all come apart. Feel very sad. You know, I've I've got a cousin who lives in Bulawayo, the Pilisovs, they're farmers. And uh, they, um, they are fully entrenched in, 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 in Bulawayo. We can never forget those years, but really, what, did, what was achieved after all that? You know, if we could have stayed in one place, built a business, if our children could have joined our businesses in, in Zimbabwe, but that wasn't to be, just wasn't to be. I'm much like you. When did you leave? 73. Yeah, that's mm. about when everyone started looking at, you know, over the, mm. over the wall. But, uh, and Stan, you're, you know, you're living in South Africa. Um, how do you see the future? What do you see as the future in South Africa? the way things are going? I think that South Africa is Africa. And what happens in Africa happens in Africa. I'm not expecting any miracles. We live in a... We live in a cocoon. I mean, there's two, well, there's two South Africans. There's South Africa and there's Cape Town. And... Uh, it's a very uh, pleasant, secluded life here. The weather's good, the people are nice. We mix mainly with uh, extraditions. And uh, in fact, only I'd say. Right. The future of South Africa is going to be the future of Africa. Who knows? I mean, look what's happened to Zimbabwe. Right. We cry about it, but that's their country. It's not ours anymore. Right. Do you see? Do you see and, uh, any? Do you see any similarities in the process in South Africa? I see very, very close similarities because this is a black man's country. I mean, you know, if they would accept us as equal partners, maybe there's a future, but. I understand that this is a black man's country and they'll do it the way they want to do it. Right. I mean, we, you know, we, we read about how they're culling elephants. For what? They're killing the environment, the land, the farms are wasted. It's terrible. Right. That's the way it is. I, uh, I'm only, I think that the greatest benefit I've had is the time that we've had in Israel and the fact that my kids are there. That's, a, that's being in touch with reality. Right. And more than that, I can't tell you. So Stan, if, if we were to step back a bit, and I remember your dad, for example, being very involved in, uh, in the running of the shul in his later years. I, I didn't know him as a younger man, but he seemed to have quite a spiritual side to him. He was quite involved in the, in the shul. Is, did he have a background of a religious home at all? No. And we've always been orthodox in the Rhodesian sense. Right. Sure, on Friday, I'd observe all the... He never had a kosher home, but he was very involved with the shul, always. Right. And eventually, the honorary life president. Right. And uh, so... Our life revolved around that sort of background, the mind, and certainly, and Doreen's uh, 
parents are also very orthodox. Right. So, you know, it's his involvement there. Well, that was his life. I mean, he really enjoyed what he was doing, right. and I'm sure he contributed a great deal. He did, absolutely. I, but he, I, when he, when he was he died, actually... He was actually, I remember him leaning, he would run the service, he knew the service was backwards. He did everything. He, you know, we brought him to Cape Town and he died in Cape Town. But I took him back to, uh, to Harare to be buried. Right. Which is sad. And, and, he, and, and in fact, you are responsible for me keeping in touch because of the uh, cemetery pictures that were that were recorded. Right. I remember, you remember those in the early days when the, when the, when the idea was muted to, right. to register all the...